I don't know when we will draft those, but also yeah. some who grew up there, high school, college, and stayed in touch with people, mm -hmm. um, coaches, teammates. I reached out to a bunch yesterday. The first person to get back to me was Ben Sergio. Nice. I'm definitely going. Nice. Uh, tell me, what kind of numbers are you looking at for the Michigan <laughs> Thomas contingent, and how special is it that so many different people from, from your past are going to be? It's really special and also very scary uh, because the hall allows you to buy 150 tickets. And I'm trying to explain to my friends and family back home, like half of those are already going to be just Cleveland Browns players and coaches, uh, which leaves you a very small amount for some other people that are very special in your life, going back to teammates at Wisconsin and uh, friends growing up. So there's going to be a lot of people there, uh, and that's a good problem that I have trying to figure out how to get everybody into the stadium. You ever know how expensive it was going to be to have all those coaches? Well, uh, I assume that the 150 tickets that we were allotted were what we were given, and then we could buy on top of that. And they told us today, no, you get six tickets, and then you get to buy 144. And I'm going, what? At, at, what's the cost? So, uh, yeah, being a Hall of Famer, it turns out, it's very expensive. Actually, being here, Joe, no one knows your name. What, what's that like? Um, it's really cool. So, everything's been so surreal. Even before the knock on the door happened, you know, going into this process, I felt very strongly that I had a good resume to make the Hall of Fame this season. Um, and then the knock happened. And that was kind of a surreal moment having Walter Jones there. It was a little bit of a, wow, this is really happening. Then the Merlin Olson Hall of Fame luncheon, Leroy Butler came up to me and said, Joe, congratulations. I'm so happy to have you in the Hall of Fame. And he was a guy that was one of my idols growing up in Wisconsin, watching him win a Super Bowl for the Packers. That was another one of those moments. Um, and then driving up here today, seeing your face on a huge mural outside of the Hall of Fame in Canton. That was another one of those moments where it was kind of like a pinch me, whoa, this is really happening. This is not some dream that you're just going to wake up from. Um, and I imagine there'll be more moments like that as we get closer to August. Um, but I'm definitely relishing every single one of those. people to, to handle your induction speech yeah. for 10, 15, 20 folks? Yeah, that was the crazy thing is, you know, after it became official, people started asking me about, you know, have you thought about your speech, which I haven't, um, and have you thought about your presenter, which I figured that the presenter probably had to happen before I could start worrying about the speech, sort of the priorities. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of guys – they play in one place with one head coach, maybe one ownership group, and um, they have maybe one buddy that's been with them forever. Well, I was lucky enough to play for six head coaches and nine offensive coordinators and two owners and about a thousand teammates, um, which makes the ticket situation tricky, but it also makes the presenter situation a little bit tricky because I feel like I'm really close with a lot of them, like as much losing as we did in Cleveland, like I still made so many great relationships and so many great friends. So initially I was having some conversations with some close friends and confidants about, hey, who do you think would make sense for me to be the presenter? And I bounced a few names off of them. And I was really thinking I was going to have Alex Mack be my presenter because he's my best friend from my time in the NFL and we're still really close. And um, I think you do a great job giving a speech. And then I talked to my agent and my agent said, you know, they don't have to give a speech anymore. There's actually a video that they'll show of your presenter. And then they just come up on stage and stand with you. So there's not a pressure of having them being on stage, giving a speech on your behalf. And so then I thought about it and I said, you know, what? as much as I love Alex, who's been an even bigger part of my career and my life from even before I got into the NFL, through my time in the NFL, who was that rock that I always came home to? 
Um, and it became pretty obvious that I wanted my wife and my kids to be my presenter. So I told them the other night as we were um, watching the congratulations videos that the Browns put out there. And uh, my daughter Reese didn't pay any attention. She's four. So I'm like, all right, I get that. You don't care. Uh, but the other three were just in tears. They were so excited. They were crying. My son was bouncing up and down on the bed, just like he did when Walter Jones was standing at the door in 10 below zero weather. And it just reaffirmed it in that moment that those are the people that um, I definitely want to be the ones that are on stage with me when the cape comes off the bust as my presenter. What does it mean to you especially the first time you get to call the hall this next day down in Denver and you get that honor? It feels awesome. It feels like a great responsibility for one of the most proud franchises in NFL history with certainly among, in my biased opinion, the most proud fan base in the NFL. Um, to carry that torch is something that I'll remember till the day I die. Uh, but I actually didn't even realize that until quite recently because we were backstage before the NFL honors and they had a camera there that was interviewing everybody. And the lady that was running the camera asked, how does it feel to be the first Cleveland Brown in the Hall of Fame? And I was like, what? There's like 18 of them. Like, what is she talking about? And I felt bad kind of correcting her in that moment, but she was clearly very wrong. But then it dawned on me that there's been nobody else since 99, and that's what she meant. She may not have said it like that, but she was saying basically this new Browns, which it's a new team. I mean, the old Browns moved to Baltimore. Um, to be that first member to get elected to the Hall of Fame, it kind of sunk in, and then I felt that responsibility that I was just talking about. Like, wow, this is a... I know this is a big deal, but like I feel like maybe it's even a bigger deal than I was able to comprehend uh, before that moment. What do you think uh, the Shrine Day would be like? Uh, what the Browns fans have in there? Is that like having your own home Super Bowl or not? It's going to be a Browns home game. I can't wait. I, I hope that they fill the stadium and they have a big party because uh, I know I'll be having a big party. I can't wait. I think um, the coolest thing, maybe the, it's hard to say coolest, but definitely one of the coolest things since I've been inducted was just the fans that I've run into being in Cleveland or when we were at the Super Bowl or being back home in Wisconsin, um, having people come up and say, hey, I've been a Browns fan since blah, blah, blah. And they all want to tell you, I've been a season ticket holder since whenever. And they just say, you know what? You've given us so much pride in these lean years that we've had. And the fact that we can identify with you as one of us, a guy that spent 11 seasons in Cleveland, had a chance to leave but didn't, makes us so proud to be able to celebrate you and your career uh, in Canton this summer. And for me, I've always felt that I was at my happiest. I've had greatest joy when I'm making other people proud. And I think that was part of maybe the success I had in sports. It was like, I always wanted to please my coach. I always wanted to make him and my parents proud of me. And in the NFL, you know, I always wanted to make my wife and then my kids, once I had kids, like proud of what I was on the football field. And knowing that there's going to be a lot of Browns fans in Canton in August, proud of what I did. And me being able to be up on stage and represent the values that the city of Cleveland has and the people that are Browns fans throughout the state of Ohio just makes me beam with pride. Joe, would you uh, allow yourself to think about just having a new and great set of fans and how <laughs> powerful that can be? I, I remember you talking yeah. about even the Legends Club and yeah. the size of it and things like that. And that's a pretty bogus dollar that was given there. So I'm yeah. repeating myself and trying to get a little yeah. bit yeah, this, this is cool for me because this is their first real memories of me as a football player. You know, um, they love football, but we're not watching reruns of 2013 Browns games. Like, so <laughs> other than a couple pictures in the house, they don't really know me as a football player. And so going through this Hall of Fame process, it's almost like introducing them to their dad, the football player, which they didn't know. 
Um, so I've definitely, definitely really enjoyed that part of, of this process. And I think we were talking about speeches today because they said, you know, hey, we've got a speech writer. If you, anybody needs help, um, you're supposed to keep the speech between seven and 10 minutes. And I instantly made a note. Speech can't be longer than five minutes because I know there's going to be at least two minutes of crying <laughs> that I won't be able to talk at all when my kids are up on stage because I'm an emotional person and seeing them being part of it uh, is definitely going to take me a few extra minutes to get through my speech. Uh, on, on the point of your, uh, how did that, did you, did you break the news, Alex Mack? Hey, <laughs> well, I didn't tell him he was the runner up yet, but I'm sure he'll see it. But I, I know he's gonna understand. <laughs> On a radio interview, you made like a passing reference to the four that you mentioned, that you were kind of using it to teach, not against your kids, but for both your kids. Like, you don't know when the knock on the door is coming, so yeah. you better behave. Did, did that yeah. play itself out? Yeah, so it actually worked that day because their rooms were clean when uh, the Hall of Fame <laughs> crew came. Um, and actually, my daughter, Reese, my four year old, took Walter Jones, like, everywhere like showed her his room her room and like showed him all the rooms and the playroom and everything and it was all nice and clean so mom was real happy um but in hindsight i realized that my wife actually did know when they were coming it wasn't a surprise and so uh she kind of knew when it needed to be really really clean and the day that it came uh the only thing i noticed that was different was like the knives that are usually by the sink they're over on the other side and I saw them, I go, huh, that's a stupid move. <laughs> now I got to walk all the way over there every time I need to use the, the knife. I'm like, what an inefficient way to set up your kitchen. But as a good husband, I was like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. But she was trying to make it nice and neat for the film crew. Um, the last week of the regular season, I asked you, Joel, about you going to the Hall of Fame. You gave a gushing answer. But you prefaced it by saying, with the exception of us having to go out and watch your <laughs> Yeah, I've avoided him. Kept my head down because I know that means an extra week of training camp for those poor guys. But uh, hopefully the coaching staff will take that under consideration. I know that most of the starters don't play in the Hall of Fame game anyway. It's just a matter of losing a week of your summer vacation, which kind of sucks. Uh, so maybe I have to buy him dinner or something next time I see him. Kevin's got Oh, well, there you go. Now that, now that, that's a carrot. I like that. Maybe he owes me a dinner. Then. How did Andy make it up to your week after the season? <laughs> Has the trust been restored in the relationship? The trust is restored. I feel um, a little bit better because the night she found out we were actually in Mexico. We, were, we took the kids down to Mexico for like a little break. Uh, it was around the Martin Luther King holiday. And so we had some time off. So we were like, 20 below zero, no no thanks. We're going to go and get some sun. So we were down there, and she got the call when we were, like, out on the beach one day. And that was the night. We usually try to have one night where we go out to dinner and have a date night. No kids. <laughs> no no madness. And uh, I brought a few extra beers for the road <laughs> in the back of the Uber. And she was all nervous because she just found out I was in the Hall of Fame. And I didn't know anything. So. So she was like so nervous she wasn't drinking. So I ended up drinking her beers on the way to the <laughs> restaurant. And by the time we got there, like I'm ordering margaritas and she's not drinking them. So I'm drinking them. So I got a little sloshed and uh, she kind of got mad at me because it wasn't the romantic date night she was expecting. <laughs> but in hindsight, now I don't feel bad about it because I knew how nervous she was that if I would have been sober enough to talk, she would have had to hold this secret for me the entire time so in the end it was a good idea that i drank too many mexican beers that night so she didn't have this big pressure of holding that secret from me in the moment and joe you could choose uh it, it, maybe it doesn't matter the order in, in which you speak like the first and the middle yeah and the last do you care or does, does any of that matter um i think the hall of fame has basically already told me they're probably going to put me last being that we expect most of the fans here to be Browns fans. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, if you were to combine yesterday, are you always going to ask to be in the Hall of Fame or that summer? I would like to be. I feel like it's such a part of my identity that I, I definitely want to be. I mean, they might drag me out, but I'm going to be kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> 
So how do you keep yourself motivated throughout a Hall of Fame football career? And now it just seems like you're on a whole other level into another career. Yeah. How do you keep yourself motivated and not just content with the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Well, it's two things. One, I love football, and so I love being around the game. I love coaching. I love um, I love serving. I love giving back. Like It's always been a passion when I was playing, giving back to the community in various different ways, giving back to my younger teammates, teaching them some of the knowledge, some of the wisdom that I learned from older guys that I played with, whether it be how to prepare for a practice, how to evaluate yourself on film, technique advice. Uh, and now that's kind of been a big part of what gets me out of bed every day, right? It's like giving back service. I find a lot of satisfaction in that and joy in that. Um, serving my kids, like helping them, being a servant for my wife, for my community, like giving back to Ohio where so many of my friends and family are. We still have a house in, in Cleveland, a condo where we spend a lot of time. So like giving back to that community that gave me so much, giving back to the communities in Wisconsin that I grew up in. Like that's really what gives me a lot of pride. And I find the days that I don't have an opportunity to have focus and have a goal and have a mission. And a lot of that is giving back is service. Those days are like, you find yourself just not only bored, but like feeling depressed a little bit. So it's definitely that servant mindset that I think has gotten me out of bed and motivated me to be better than I even realized that I could be. And I think that was the same thing in football. Like, if I was playing for my own individual accolades as a receiver, or quarterback or running back or something like that, I think the ceiling is kind of like right here. But when you're doing it for your teammates and you're doing it for your city and, and you're doing it for your franchise and the fans and you're doing it for your wife and your kids, like you find a different gear that you're able to play and give more than you ever realized was even possible. What's it like Yeah. Yeah. It, it's surreal. And I, I know that's become the drinking game for today because I said that a lot, but <laughs> just walking down these halls and I just took a peek as I was walking this way and saw like some of the busts and, and kind of closing my eyes and thinking that my face is going to be over there. And I think the, the moment that maybe I get to bring my kids by and be like, hey guys, you know who that is. I know he might not look just like me anymore. That's your dad. Pretty cool, huh? And I know it'll be a 50% lukewarm response, but to me, that'll be really special. And I think even kids are kids, so they're not going to give a shit. But thinking that in that moment that someday, hopefully they'll have kids and they'll be able to bring their kids back. And whether I'm around or not, like they can say, hey, this is your grandpa. That's one that really sinks in. How old are they? 10, 8, 6, and 4. And you talked about, um, you know, family and just how this makes so much sense for you. Yeah. Um, you know, other than putting up with uh, wrestling through uh, dates on the Olympic scale. <laughs> how, how much, I had to apologize. How much did she um, impact your career? Like, what, yeah. I mean, the 10 Pro Bowl, the 10,000 appearance. Behind the scenes. Yeah, she was what amazing. Did she, what did she she was such a, from? she was so much more than I can even explain behind the scenes as far as support for me. Um, a quick story to illustrate. Uh, my rookie year, I remember my strength coach saying how lucky I was that my wife had played college sports, that she was a basketball player at Wisconsin. And I didn't think about it. Uh, but he said, you know what? Before I got here, we had a, one of his um, players that he, he had coached. And he's like, every time the guy gets home from training camp, the wife's like, All right, what do we do now? We're going to the mall. Let's go do this. Let's go hang out with friends. Let's go to dinner. And like, it became friction in their relationship because he's like, no, I'm exhausted. The last thing I want to do is move anywhere but this couch. And I don't want to talk about my day because it sucked. It was really hard and I'm not ready. And for me, I never had one instance where I would come in and I would 
fall down on the couch and I'd fall asleep before dinner was ready. And Annie never was like, what's wrong with you? What, what's happened? Tell me about your day. Like she just knew when it was okay to talk, when I needed somebody to talk, when I needed somebody to lean on, um, when it was okay to maybe let, Hey, let's go, let's go on a date night. Let's go take the dogs for a walk. And sometimes when I just needed to go to the basement to take a nap, turn on some golf, fall asleep. Like she was just such a great balance. And I think that came from her background as an elite competitive athlete to understand that like what you do is really strenuous, not only your body, but your mind. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, the game against the Patriots in like year 10 or whatever. When I really had sort of like that mental breakdown in the car on the way home. And she didn't say anything the whole way. And I was just like sobbing. And finally, she couldn't handle it anymore. She's like, what's wrong? Like, you don't cry on the way home from games. And I was just like, I know, but I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> and she's like, well, you, is, you, is it your knee? Because she knew I had a real bad knee that I was dealing with. And I was like, no, I just, I played a perfect game. And she's like, did you give up a sack or did you have a bad game? I'm like, no, I played perfect. And we still lost. And that loss of the feeling of control is what got to me. Um, but she was just so good at knowing like how to be that support system at home in every way. I know you said that it's like the main thing that you taught you the yeah. psychologist mm -hmm. was to work with your body. Yep. Yeah. Um, how much did she kind of have an influence in that um you know, help you along? Yeah, I think she was great because she was just said, Hey, maybe you want to talk to somebody about this? And the Browns are great because they already have that system all in place so it's not like they had to go find anybody and it was easy for me to just go in the training room and I, I knew who the psychologists were because they were in there every Monday after games and they just got to know everybody and, and offer themselves up as that resource and so it was really easy for me to go in and just say hey is there 15 minutes that I can talk to such and such um no questions asked and it was great just right away and and I think having that immediacy of being able to find somebody to talk to and having the encouragement from your wife uh, that it's okay. You can be vulnerable. You don't have to be the big tough guy all the time. You know, sometimes it's okay to allow those emotions to come out and talk to somebody because you could probably feel better after you do. Um, you talk tickets, parties, weekends, all that stuff that you have to deal with. Have you done that process? Like, yeah. More than a little. Sure. Yeah, we're we're trying. It's been really busy. <laughs> um, I know everybody's busy, which I get annoyed saying it myself. But um, after the Hall of Fame, there's been a lot of requests on my time and I'm trying to, as best as I can, fulfill all of them and to give back to all the people that were so good to me during my career, going all the way back to when I started playing football. Um, and I feel like I've been doing a fairly decent job. But it also has delayed a little bit some of the planning process, which is we're kind of running up against a little bit of a deadline to like get the news out to all right, who's getting the tickets? Where's the hotel? How's the transportation? So that's why it's been great being here today to kind of start to really dial in and, and hone down on saying, all right, these are the top priorities right now. We need to make sure we got that guest list because <laughs> it's coming up. August will be here before you know it. So given all your actions. Um, I don't know. <laughs> if I was talking to that person, I would probably say the same thing I would say to my son. Maybe, you know, do what you love. Um, try to find a passion because that'll give you the opportunity to wake up every day excited about what you're doing. Um, but then try to find a motivation outside of just self-satisfaction because that'll allow you to work it the hardest you possibly can towards whatever goals you have. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, early on in my career, I was really good at just kind of turning that should I or shouldn't I switch off in my head. And uh, I say this 
the worst part about going off a high dive is standing there and thinking about it. And it's like the worst part of being a football player when you're laying on the ground is thinking, am I hurt where I can't get up and I can't keep playing or am I hurt just because it's football and you're always hurt and I can keep going. And I don't know exactly why it was, but early on, I just said, I'm just going to keep playing and try to turn that should I, or shouldn't I off in my brain. And I feel like my body will tell me. And the two times I've been hurt where I couldn't keep playing, my body told me like when I was in college, my junior year, I was playing defense and I was running after uh, Cadillac Williams and I stepped and I tore my ACL and I fell to the ground and I said, yep, I tore my ACL. There was no question about like, oh, am I going to keep playing? And then my last game of my career, I tore my tricep tendon. And as soon as I threw Brian Arabco, I go, yep, tore my tricep tendon. And you just know when you know. Um, and so I think that was sort of a, a blessing in my career that I never had to like think about how hurt was I? I just, you know, I was just going to keep going and until my body said I couldn't. What year did you feel? What year did you feel the closest to the Browns to the Bills? Well, it would have been my rookie year when we won ten and six. Um, but I mean, you don't really know anything when you're a rookie. I would say outside of that, it was 2014 when we were pretty good. I forget what we were. At one point, we were right around first place in in the division midway through the season. And I felt like we had something. Um, I'm not sure that I believe we were going to win the Super Bowl. I didn't think we had the talent or all the right positions to like make a run and win the Super Bowl. But I thought we could have made the playoffs and possibly, you know, won a game or two there. Yeah. <laughs> How would you like to go back to the Lakefront Stadium back in the day, Jim Brown? How what kind of player do you think you would have been? Man, I feel like Jim Brown. Yeah, yeah. I love playing in bad elements, so that would have been fun. But I think Jim Brown would have been bigger than me. Even. He was a pretty big running back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would have been fun playing on a team that has so much talent, that's so good, that just steamrolls people. So. Thanks, guys. Yeah, see you guys.